had collapsed. Now, I don't remember much about the actual illness, but I do have two vivid memories of this place. The first, a period of starvation when I screamed for food. And the second was that I was gradually weaned back to life on a nitrogen-free diet, which consisted mainly of stewed apple. And I still can't look the stuff in the face. Hey, just try and find your kidney, Dave, with some cold jelly. Come in. A bit cold. A bit cold, isn't it? I'll just use this probe to try and find it. Oh, now you can see the end of it. And in fact, it's about 11 centimetres. It looks perfectly normal. Oh, it's quite just big. Go on and find your liver. Liver? Turn over on your back. That's oh. fine. A bit more cold jelly. And what does that do? That just helps the sound signals from the probe get through to the head of the probe without any interference from air or other materials. If you take a deep breath in for me, and you just see your liver coming down into the picture. Eww. There, we'll freeze it. Uh, Looks quite normal as well, no gallstones. All is revealed for the first time. Good bit of gear, that it's all made of protein and so is most of the rest of me muscle blood and of course protein contains nitrogen now if i showed you my tummy again in about six weeks time it'd look the same but it wouldn't be the same because all the time the whole of my body is being remodeled and repaired now all the nitrogenous waste from that goes into my liver where it's detoxified and during that process, some pretty nasty things are released, like yes, ammonia. Absolutely ghastly. And if that built up for any time in my body, I die. So it's immediately in my liver changed into urea, which is shunted down to my kidneys, where it voided from my body without too much loss of water. And there's the problem. Because if anything goes wrong with my kidneys, then I start to die, poisoned from the inside by nitrogenous waste. Now, in the old days, you were either lucky like I was, or you died. Today, you're shunted off to the renal dialysis unit. Where you come at regular intervals to be attached to a mechanical kidney, which washes the nitrogenous waste out of your system. And while you lie and wait, you hope that in the not too far distant future, a kidney donor will be found so that you can be put back into full working order. Nitrogen, a potential killer, and yet it's all around us, a wraparound blanket of potential death. You see, the air which is pushing me very along and the air I breathe, 78% of it consists of gaseous nitrogen. <gasps> In it goes. Now, my body can take up all the oxygen it requires and get rid of the excess carbon dioxide. But all that nitrogen goes in and what goes in comes back out. You see, because nitrogen is chemically inert. And if it wasn't, I tell you, I'd be in all sorts of problems. Why, I'd need a fellow kidneys the size of me sail, and the nitrogenous waste I'd produce would kill this bald stone dead. The nitrogen stays put in the air, and I get all I need from the food I eat. The same goes for moo cows and all other animals. They get the nitrogen they need from the food they eat. And in the cycle of things, it comes out here and in other places to enrich the soil with nitrate and ammonia. But first of all, the solid stuff has to be broken down by fungi and bacteria before the nitrogen can be taken up by the plants once again. Lightning can and does fix a lot of nitrogen from the air, but as the nitrate is so soluble, it quickly gets washed away through the soil. And this has been the problem throughout evolution. Nitrogen is essential for all life, but too much will kill. So how does the inert nitrogen from the air get into the cycle of life, and how is it kept in balance and control?
a handful of hidden wealth. Some call it dirt, people talk about soiling their hands, but that's one of the most precious resources on the face of this earth, living soil from the minerals, organic matter, and of course crawling with life, worms and insect mites and millipedes, and they're all doing a phenomenal job breaking down and cleaning up the soil and giving it structure. And there we can see the structure, little knobbly, crummy bits, and because they don't fit together, there are holes and channels and cavities. The perfect habitat for mega multi-billions of wonderful bacteria, the farmer's friend. Meet Nitrous Ammonas. Using nothing more than the energy of decay, he fixes nitrogen from the air and adds nitrate to the soil. Free fertilizer. Meet Pseudomonas, which does the opposite, releasing nitrogen back into the air. And you could fit millions of them on the head of a pin. So how, you may well ask, can such tiny little things do such an important job? fix the nitrogen out of the atmosphere down into the soil as fertiliser. Well, if I were to harvest all the microorganisms out of just one acre of good farm soil, I'd end up with a pile like this. Five tonnes, and they're all bacteria. A perfectly balanced, well-regulated soil and a perfectly balanced, well-regulated body. That's what the nitrogen cycle's all about. And here I am in tropical rainforest, the world's most efficient nitrogen-fixing factory. And it's going on all around me. Nitrogen from the atmosphere fixed into nitrate fertiliser. No wonder the trees grow so big and tall. The animals help them on their way. Even the sloth, who is climbing back up the tree after leaving a small nitrogen-rich deposit on the forest floor. The sloth also gets in on the Nitrogen Fixation Act, for living on its fur are blue-green microorganisms. They provide this slow-moving creature with much-needed camouflage. A close look reveals the special oval cells, which have the ability to fix nitrogen from the air. In fact, everywhere you look, nitrogen fixers are hard at work, and nothing goes to waste, for there are plenty of recyclers hard at work as well. So perhaps it's little wonder that in the absence of livers and kidneys, the plants store away excess nitrogen in their living cells, some of it in the form of very toxic chemicals called alkaloids. One such substance is curare, it's extracted from a forest vine and then put to good use by the local people to tip their darts with poison. Scientific study has shown that one set of poisons has the amazing ability to relax the muscles of the heart. And it is this nitrogen-containing chemical that has made open heart surgery possible. Some of the nitrogenous secrets of the forest are labelled on this very special nature trail. The yam, which gave the world the contraceptive pill, and many more medicinal plants await thorough analysis. To date, only about 1% of the plants found growing in our forest have been tested by modern science. But every minute sees the destruction of 30 hectares, that's one every two seconds, of this treasure house of plant secrets all overflowing with nitrogen. A backdrop of tropical rainforest, fixing nitrogen, cooling the air and binding the soil on these steep hill slopes. But here, it's all being cleared to make way for new citrus groves. Result, bare, hot slopes. The soil gets washed away and with it goes all that precious nitrogen. 
In some parts of the world, agriculture is still severely limited by the availability of nitrogen, so a farmer has to know quite a bit about the families of the plants he's dealing with. Elementary botany, pretty boring stuff, but there's one family of the flowering plants you should all know about and you should learn to respect, and that's this, the pea flower family. Now, that very, very distinctive flower with its wings and its keel. If there's a flower like that on top of the plant, you can bet your bottom dollar that on the roots there are going to be dozens of these tiny nodules, inside which there are bacteria that have the ability to fix the nitrogen from the atmosphere and put it both into the plant and into the soil. Now, it's quite amazing that the whole success of the whole plant and animal kingdom all depends on those microorganisms. Perhaps it's because nitrogen is too poisonous that we leave it up to them to filter just enough into the living system. And here in the oasis, we can still see crop rotation going on. Cereals and cabbage taking the nitrogen out, and then a crop of legumes putting the nitrogen back in again. A checkerboard of success. Not all that long ago, crop rotation was the way of the agricultural world, keeping our landscapes in some sort of balance and the soil in good fettle. Water meadows fertilised by winter floods produce flower-filled hay to feed the animals, and soils unploughed since time immemorial detoxified any excess nitrogen, returning it to the atmosphere. The soils and the ancient meadows were the kidneys and the liver of the land, and while they were in good working order, the countryside remained in good heart and the rivers flowed clear and pure down towards the sea. By the 1950s, scenes like this were beginning to become a thing of the past, in part because of massive application of nitrogenous fertiliser. Chemists had learnt the tricks of the nitrogen fixation trade. They'd learned to take nitrogen out of the air and turn it into ammonia, which is a compound of nitrogen. They then combined it with nitric acid to make nitrate fertiliser. Bacteria do it with recycled waste. The factories use fossil fuel. This, above all, changed the face of farming. No need to rotate crops, no need to rest the soil in fallow, just bung on the nitrogen and rake in the crops. And didn't they do well? Unfortunately, at the same time, they were disrupting and distorting the natural nitrogen cycle. The same is true of modern animal husbandry. It's not just that factory farming lacks compassion, it's that it creates vast quantities of nitrogenous waste, which has to go somewhere. The birds must like it, they said. Just look how fast they grow. And so did the amount of effluent pouring into our rivers.
The rivers still try to do their best, but many have been tamed beyond all recognition. I mean, just look at that. It used to meander its way across the flatlands through all weed swamps and fens, each one extracting nitrate from the water, part of the natural nitrogen cycle of the countryside. Now, it's just as if they put a bypass canal straight through the middle of the kidneys of the countryside. It hasn't got a chance. And we don't help much by driving, for our exhaust gases contain NOx, nitrogen oxide, adding more nitrate to the cycle and pollution to boot. Sewage works had to be updated and upgraded because whole rivers were becoming no more than dead sewers. It all cost money. Rivers had to be put on life support systems just to keep them alive. It all cost money, and still the nitrate poured into the water supply. The world became worried as new lives and new lifestyles were put in danger, for too much nitrate in the drinking water can kill cattle and young humans alike. Bottle-fed babies can suffer from methemoglobinemia when nitrites react with the haemoglobin in their blood, sometimes with fatal results. So in the 1950s, the World Health Organization got worried about potential infant mortality. And in 1980, the EC passed legislation stating that drinking water must not contain more than 50 milligrams of nitrate per litre. So new monitoring programs got underway. Now, I'm at the helm of a very special boat. It belongs to the Plymouth Marine Laboratory, and it's packed full of wonderful monitoring equipment. And as we're going along down the estuary of the Tamar, all the time we're sampling the water, the intermix between the fresh water and the seawater. And one of the things we're analysing for is nitrate. The problem isn't just the nitrates in the river water. The nitrates are going to end up in the sea, where they can cause other problems along the coast. Well, it's all changed a bit since I did it with a Bunsen burner and a test tube or two, so Dr Nick Owen, well, now you're uh, Mr Nitrogen Cycling in the Sea. What did it tell us? Well, what this one is telling us is the amount of nitrate coming down the the River Tamar here, that's where we are, and in this particular river we don't really have a nitrate problem. Uh, the levels are really quite low and they, they're they not really having much of an effect in the, in the coastal waters. Okay, so this is not a bad river. Now, have we got a nasty river as far as nitrate is concerned in Britain? Well, there are, there are some where the nitrate levels are much, much higher than this. I mean, the, the, all the rivers and going into the, the Humber estuary, they're very much higher concentrations of nitrate than we've got here. And of course, Humber, we've got lots and lots of agriculture, yeah. pigs, and it's yeah. a big river, isn't it? Yeah, in terms of river flow, I mean, it far out, out, outweighs the amount of water coming down this river. And that's about how much higher, nitrate-wise? In terms of concentration, three, four times higher than the concentration in this river. But of course, if you multiply that concentration up by the amount of water, in terms of tons of nitrogen, it's a lot more. But not far away, on the other side of the North Sea, thanks mainly to discharges from the Rhine, the conditions are really bad, especially in the shallow waters shown in deep green on the map. Holland, wonderful Holland, the most densely populated nation on Earth, the second most highly industrialised nation in the world, and of course famous for its agriculture and its horticulture. And if you can grow crops and flowers as intensively and as well as they can, you need a lot of expertise, a lot of chemicals, and yes, you've guessed it, a lot of fertiliser, bung full of nitrogen. 
So it's little wonder that night vision is a problem wherever you poke your nose. You can even smell ammonia in the air, especially in those areas where pigs are raised. 14 million of them every year, almost all of them in factory farm conditions, where they produce a phenomenal 100 million tonnes of manure every year. It's such a big problem that they set up a pig research station to sniff out the solution. <laughs> Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. Pig dung and pig urine. No, it isn't nasty, horrible stuff. It's just pig food recycled in a different way. After all, we eat the bit round the outside and this comes through the middle. And it's when the dung hits the urine that the nitrogen problems really begin. Let me plop it in and show you. Here, give it a shake up. Now the enzymes in the dung begin to react and release ammonia. And, oh, and there it is. And the ammonia really doesn't do anyone any good. It doesn't do the pig or the workers in the pig units any good. And it doesn't do the atmosphere and the environment of Holland any good either because up goes the ammonia and it will kill the leaves off on the tree stone dead. And of course, being very, very soluble, it gets washed back down again by the rain into the soil where it's denitrified by all those little bacteria and turned into acid nitric acid. So all round, it's a very, very bad environmental problem which must be solved. And that's what this pig research station's all about. For those of you like me who abhor the idea of factory farming, these sequences will appall you. But at least the work here is trying to improve the lot, both of the pigs and of the environment. Much of the work consists of building pig toilets to separate the dung from the urine as quickly as possible and cut down the surface area of ammonia release. Here I am at the control centre of the whole research system. You see, as the feeding of the pigs is computer controlled, they're now tackling the problem and seeing whether they can ration the amount of nitrogen that goes in at the front end. You see, an awful lot's known about the dietary requirements of the pig, and so they can limit the amount of the nitrogen in those essential amino acids that goes into the feedstuff, and then ration the amount of nitrogen throughout the whole growth cycle of the pig. The magic being, of course, what doesn't go in at the front end can't come out of the back end and cause all those problems. So here I am able to control the amount of nitrogen in the pee and the poo. From piglet to home cured ham. And here they're trying to limit the pollution of the air and the waterway, and it's working. But then there's still the problem of what to do with the masses of solid waste, which is also rich in nitrogen. So they've set up a special processing plant for pig poo too. As it was the farmer that produced the problem, the farmer's going to have to pay to clean up the effluent. And to make it fair and above board, all the time a sample's being taken to ascertain how much liquid and how much solid there is in the effluent. Because you see, the more liquid that's present, the more it's going to cost the farmer. But it must be money well spent, because from this horrible brown gooey muck full of all sorts of nitrate and other environmental problems. On the one hand, we're going to end up with a highly saleable product on the international market, and on the other hand, water pure enough even for a visitor like me to drink. First, the slurry is fermented in these huge digester tanks where methane is piped off to help heat the plant in the winter. The processed slurry is then separated. 
The liquid is thoroughly stirred and aerated and the solids are dried on a series of rotating drums so that they can be formed into dry nitrogen rich pellets. Finally, the liquid is heated and distilled to free it from all possible pathogens and impurities. The end of the process. On the one hand, water, pure enough for me to drink, and it does taste good, almost pure distilled water, and in the other hand, pelletised organic fertiliser. And the interesting thing is, in there is much of the nitrogen and the other minerals that were originally imported into Holland in the food to give to the pigs. And now they're ready for export to go out across the world and grow new crops. So perhaps it is possible for us to begin to put the nitrate cycle of the world back into some sort of balance and order. And this bit is all thanks to my friend the pig. The only problem, of course, it takes an awful lot of energy. And if, like me, you're saying, why don't you keep them in the open air on free range, it'd be better for the pigs, I agree. But then, dealing with their effluent could be even more of a problem. So if we want to eat pork, we must pay to clean up the excess nitrates, just as we must pay to clean up nitrogenous poisons in our own bodies if our kidneys give up doing the job for us. It costs an awful lot of money to run a kidney dialysis unit like this to clean up the nitrogenous waste in people. It costs an awful lot of money for a kidney transplant to put one human being back into working order. To put planet Earth back into working order nitrogen-wise will only be accomplished at immense cost. But like this, it must be money well spent. Next Thursday at 8, David Bellamy looks at the phosphorus cycle. Below the...